<clears throat> so um, hopefully, you know, this will give you a little information about prostate cancer and why we use it, why we use radiation and how we use radiation for prostate cancer. Um, I, and then we're talking a little bit about brachytherapy today too, mostly um, in the prostate cancer sphere, but I'll just give you some introduction into kind of um, other ways we use it as well. <clears throat> so you may or may not have seen this before. This is from the American Cancer Society. They kind of put these out every year. Um, and pretty, basically I just wanted to point out, you know, prostate cancer, we all know it's pretty common. Um, it is the most common diagnosed cancer in men in the United States. And actually, even though we think of it as a relatively treatable disease, um, it does account for, you know, it's a second, second leading cause of cancer deaths. Um, this does not include skin cancers. So after skin, <clears throat> you know, lung and then prostate. So it is a big problem and it is uh, one of the um, uh, cancers that we, you know, treat commonly in radiation oncology. Um, as you guys have probably heard, you know, in other lectures or if you've been exposed to other oncologic um, rotations, uh, we use this TNM staging, which allows us to stage the cancer um, and kind of come up with treatment um, regimens depending on the stage of the cancer. So the T is a tumor stage, N is nodal stage, and M is for metastasis or spread. Um, <clears throat> and this is just pointing out kind of the way that, that um, the TNM stage is uh, defined. So if um, you randomly get some other procedure on your prostate and you're diagnosed with cancer, you're a T1, um, A or B, if the most, this is the most common situation, a T1C, when a patient gets a screening PSA, a prostate-specific antigen blood test, and that's elevated, and then they get a biopsy that shows they have prostate cancer. Um, other ways, you know, it can be found is by palpating a nodule um, on the prostate gland by a digital rectal exam, um, and, then, and then that's defined, the T-stage is defined as how extensive the disease is. And if it goes outside the prostate um, locally, it's a T3. If it goes to other organs, it's a T4. And then if you have regional nodes, it's an N1. If you have nodes outside the pelvis or uh, bone disease or other visceral disease, that's a, you know, metastatic. <clears throat> so that's kind of just an overview of the staging. But more commonly, we use something called an NCCN risk grouping, and you guys may be familiar or heard about the NCCN, which is a commonly used kind of resource um, to give us information about different cancers, as well as a kind of a consensus recommendation from panelists on, um, you know, how to treat those cancers. So as you can see here, um, we don't just use the TNM staging to, de to determine um, how someone should be treated for prostate cancer. We group them into these risk groupings, so low, intermediate, high, or very high. And those depend on your T stage, which we just talked about, and N stage, but, um, and then Gleason score, which is the score that you get at the time of the biopsy, kind of like the grade of the cancer, how aggressive it is. And that basically goes from six up to 10. Um, and then also your PSA, like we talked about when they get the blood draw, you know, what that number is. So you can see, you know, it, how, how the classification goes. Obviously a higher grade cancer, eight or above is kind of in this high risk group, six is low risk, and then in the middle is seven. And then there's some other ways that we break it down. Um, and this affects some of the treatment recommendations specifically for radiation, um, but that's a little more nuanced. So that's the NCCN risk grouping. So kind of like, you know, the kind of the staging we think about when we, we think about prostate cancer. <clears throat> so this is an example of one of the schemas from the NCCN. This is from 2019. If a patient is diagnosed with a prostate cancer and they have more than 10 years to live, we do recommend some kind of treatment. And this is just an example to show you how many treatment options someone diagnosed with prostate cancer can have. And this is kind of, you know, uh, if we go back, um, this is using kind of a potential like patient that has intermediate risk cancer, for example. So 
what options could they have? So they can undergo surveillance, which basically means they're monitored. And if their PSA rises or the Gleason score goes up, then they get active treatment. They could get external beam radiation treatment. They could get brachytherapy treatment. We'll talk about these two things. They can get external beam with hormone therapy, which I'm not going to go into, but is a testosterone blocking agent that is thought to augment the effect of, of radiation. They could get brachytherapy and hormone therapy. They could get all three of those things, or they could get surgery. So, you know, if you're the patient, uh, it's a little confusing and you may be biased by who you see first as far as which treatment option you choose. But you can see there's a lot of different kind of ways that someone who's newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, you know, could potentially be treated depending on uh, things that we'll go into. The reason that- Can, can I ask a question yeah. about the uh, NCCN? So, yeah. um, it doesn't, does that look at, uh, for the PSA values, does it take age or like PSA velocity or any of these other measures that you can use um, to adjust PSA? Or it's just looking at absolute? Yeah, so the risk groupings really is just looking at the absolute PSA. Um, but when we think about kind of the treatment options for a patient, you may take those things into account, PSA velocity, doubling time, PSA density, which is a measure of PSA based on the volume of the prostate. Also other things that are a little more nuanced, like how, like you can see here, less than 50% positive cores, they can become a favorable intermediate, which basically means, you know, like low volume disease, meaning they just don't have a lot of cancer in their glands. So there are things that, you know, we think about um, more nuanced, which will, you know, help you decide between all these radiation options, for example. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you might be thinking, well, they have all these options, but how do you know, like, which one's better? Why don't you just tell them, like, which one to do, right? Um, and for, you know, for, well, if we go back to here, you know, for each risk group, it's a little bit different, but in general, um, you know, for low risk patients, they can be observed or get treated. For intermediate and high risk patients, we usually recommend getting treated. But the question of surgery versus radiation, there's no good randomized evidence, you know, comparing them head to head. This trial um, that was recently published, the PROTECT trial, is actually kind of our biggest um, uh, trial looking at the modalities of surgery, radiation, or active monitoring, aka active surveillance for low and intermediate risk patients. And you can see that basically their overall survival in the inner prostate cancer specific survival is excellent no matter which one they choose. So often they really do have the option of choosing. Um, it's not like in other cancers where we say, oh, you really need to get surgery, you know, get that out and then we'll do radiation or something like that. They actually can choose what they want to do. So um, radical prostatectomy, just briefly, obviously I'm not going to go into this um, in great detail, but um, you know, the currently most of these surgeries are done robotically. And I don't know if you guys have seen robotic surgeries yet or not, but it's pretty interesting. The surgeon sits at these like console tables and then the robot actually, you know, with all these different um, ports, um, actually, you know, they're controlling that from this console over here. So it's pretty crazy, pretty interesting, um, minimally invasive type of surgery. And um, that's what is mostly done, I would say, at Stanford. In general, the main side effects, uh, other than the, you know, acute post-operative potential side effects and staying in the hospital, um, patients can have incontinence, uh, which usually the surgeons say, you know, that chance long-term is pretty low, but most of them have it right after surgery for a few weeks to months. And then they can have erectile dysfunction as well. Um, and that kind of depends on the extent of the cancer and the patient's body habitus and things like that. So um, uh, those are not super common for a long-term, but they can happen. So those are like the most common side effects for prostatectomy. Okay. I was told how to do this poll question. Relaunch. So what 
staging classification do we use um, for discussions about prostate cancer treatment options? Is it the TNM staging? Is it the NCCN risk grouping? Is it the overall TNM stage, like stage one, two, three, four? Is it the D'Amico classification? I spelled that wrong, sorry. Um, Great. Um, so most everybody got it right. It's the NCCN risk grouping. So we, um, of course, use the um, the TNM staging, you know, to stage the patient. But when we're actually talking about like what are their treatment options, we really fall back on this NCCN risk grouping. Um, the D'Amico classification is another one similar to the NCCN risk grouping. It's a little bit older. Um, okay. And great. So you guys probably, I don't know how much exposure you guys have had to radiation, but um, other, you maybe don't know anything about it and you've obviously had some lectures already. So sorry if this is repetitive, but it pertains to uh, prostate cancer radiation just because we do different types. So um, we have external radiation, which typically is done with photons. Um, you may read about or hear about protons, which is a different uh, type of radiation that we do not offer at Stanford. There are only certain centers that offer proton therapy um, across the country. Um, and there are certain benefits of that, um, but they're more specifically for kids actually. Um, but you may hear about that if you hear about radiation. Um, other like buzzwords you may hear about is 3D conformal radiation, which just means we're kind of um, instead of just blasting, you know, one big open box of radiation at the patient, we're able to kind of conform the radiation a little bit. And then uh, intensity modulated radiation or volumetric arc radiation, which is IMRT or VMAT, allows us to do that even more to modulate the radiation and kind of avoid structures and things like that. So those are all kind of external radiation um, options. There's also internal radiation, which in general terms is called brachytherapy. And that's when we insert a radiation source into the patient or into an organ to radiate it from the inside instead of having it come from the outside. Other types of radiation that can be used is intraoperative radiation, stereotactic, and cyberknife treatments, uh, which I'm not really going to go into today, but those are other words you may hear throughout this kind of two-week course. I don't know if you guys have seen a machine, but this is a cool video a patient at Penn put together about his brain radiation treatment. So this is a linear accelerator you may or may have not seen. This is a treatment couch. This is an external beam treatment where, you know, the radiation is coming out of this head here and directed, you know, specifically at the patient to where we've kind of told it to go. Um, this is another schema just kind of showing that again, you guys may have already seen these kind of things, but essentially electron beam is created in that linear accelerator treatment head. And then it is with a filter changed into a photon beam. And then it's directed at the patient through the treatment head. And there's a way we can modulate that. Um, this is the treatment head and these are called MLCs or multi-leaf collimators that allow us to modulate the beam as it's coming out so that um, you can get different dose distributions, which I'll show you here, to avoid critical organs and um, target you know, the organ you wanna treat. So if you guys, I don't know, think about the prostate down in the pelvis, what critical organs are nearby that you, know, you would wanna avoid? Just shout them out. Bladder. Yep, bladder is a big one. And then what's another one? Probably posterior to that. Rectum. The colon or the rectum. Rectum, yeah, exactly. So those are like the two main ones. The prostate's right in the middle. So um, yeah, that video VMAT. So yeah, that video, Binkley, thank you. Um, that video of the guy with the, the beam moving around him, 
basically VMAT means that, um, actually we can go back. VMAT means that this is happening, this MLC collimation is happening as the beam is on and as the um, gantry is moving around the patient. So as this gantry is moving, the, um, what's happening in the treatment head are those MLCs are moving in and out and the beam is on at the same time. So we're modulating the beam as the machine's moving um, and delivering the radiation, which is basically the fastest way to deliver external beam radiation. So, and that IMRT is basically VMAT, but the, the machine can't move around in a circle like that. It basically has to go to one place, give a dose, go to another place, give a dose. So it's the same effective treatment, but it's just not as quick. So that allows us to basically um, avoid structures, you know, we want to avoid. So here we're showing potentially the prostate in the middle, 100% um, of the radiation dose, and then you can see 50% of the dose is kind of carving out potentially the rectum and the bladder um, to minimize side effects to those areas. And then I guess we kind of talked about this. 3D conformal <clears throat> is more conformal than just, like we said, shooting radiation at someone with an open rectangle. Um, so you can see that, let's say this is the prostate in the middle of the patient's body, you use four beams coming from different angles to really concentrate the dose of radiation around your target. And while you do get kind of 50% of dose spilling out here to other areas, it's much less than if you just kind of brought it in from one angle. And then you can see with VMAT or IMRT, VMAT being the faster one, um, you can really pull in those what we call isodose lines. Um, so now the 50% isodose line is instead much more conformal around your target compared to this spilling out. So sometimes we, you know, most of the time we want to use this modality VMAT or IMRT, especially for the prostate because we're going to such high doses. But sometimes, you know, using this 3D um, modality is just fine. Um, so those are the kind of things you learn in residency about when you would want to use those things. <clears throat> Here's a better maybe fancier picture. This is something called a dose color wash, again, showing the isodose levels. The red or the pink is kind of the highest, 90%, and then, you know, the yellow is like the 50%. So you can see that with VMAT or IMRT, again, we're just showing that most of the dose is concentrated around the prostate in this situation, and then we're avoiding, you know, other organs with high dose, but you can see there's this low dose spill that goes around. We said CyberKnife is another type of external radiation and that essentially delivers a similar dose distribution to VMAT. There's some nuances and differences of these two, which we won't go into today, but um, just so you know, that's a similar type of treatment. And then protons <clears throat> we were talking about is totally different and we don't offer it here. Um, the benefit of protons is that Basically, the proton comes in from one side and it stops. All of its dose is deposited at a certain depth, so you don't see exit dose. Versus in photons, the photon comes in, delivers most of its dose in the center at the target, and then goes out, so you have more exit dose. Um, in prostate radiation, there's never been a trial showing that one of these is better. So most people still use photons. Unless you have a proton machine, then you might use protons for prostate. Um, so, you know, we, you, you, I think you had a dosimetry or treatment planning lecture with Archie. Um, uh, when we do, how do we, you know, make these external beam plans is by doing um, kind of this, uh, simulation, which is just a CT scan of the patient or the area that you want to treat. So for example, this kind of middle picture shows CT scan in the sagittal and coronal view. And we've contoured here in the middle, um, the prostate, and then we have what we call a planning target volume or a PTV, uh, which accounts for motion setup um, that we've contoured as well. Uh, for prostate cancer, we often use MRIs, and this is showing kind of a fusion split screen of an MRI and a CT scan, because um, the MRI allows us to see things a little more clearly um, than the CT does. 
Um, and so we basically, when you're a resident, you learn about kind of the doses of radiation you give, the contouring, what you want to treat, what volumes, what expansions you want to use for those PTVs. And um, you work a lot on kind of this contouring phase. And then we give it over to a dosimetrist who plans the radiation for us. Um, IGRT is another thing you may hear in radiation. It basically just means that we're using what we call onboard imaging on a daily basis to um, line the patient up. So um, for prostate cancer, we put these little gold markers, you can kind of see them here outlined in the pink, um, into the prostate before we actually deliver the treatment. And that allows us on a daily basis to take x-rays. So for example, here's an x-ray on the day that the patient had the simulation. And then here's the x-ray down below on, of the patient on the day of treatment. And then we can line up so that those gold fiducials are in the kind of place they were in at the treatment planning session so that we can verify we're delivering the radiation exactly to the spot we want to, because that's a really important part of radiation. Obviously, you don't want to treat the wrong area. <clears throat> okay, here's another question. Let me do the poll thing again. So, which is not a form of external beam radiation treatments? Intensity modulated radiation, volumetric arc radiation, or VMAT, uh, brachytherapy, or CyberKnife? Great. Hopefully that was an easy question. You all got it right, it is brachytherapy. So all of these other ones allow for radiation to be delivered externally and then brachytherapy is an internal radiation treatment. So um, let's talk a little bit about brachytherapy. Um, so the word comes from the Greek word brachy, which essentially means short range. So again, we're basically putting a piece of radiation or a source of radiation into something. And then, you know, the fall off of radiation dust around that source is quite tight, up to like five millimeters. So you're basically um, just giving radiation in short range right around that source. Um, there's different ways it can be delivered. Intracavitary means you're putting it like into a cavity. So that's typically the terminology used for um, gynecological procedures where we put the source into the vagina or the cervix or the uterus. Um, interstitial means we're putting it through tissue. So for prostate, um, it is interstitial and we'll show you some pictures of what that is. And then in prostate cancer specifically, there's kind of different buzzwords that are used um, for brachytherapy, one is a low dose rate or permanent seed implant, and then the other is a high dose or a temporary um, implant, and I'll talk about what the differences are. Um, again, I just wanted to give you guys kind of an overview of when, you know, how brachytherapy really can be used. So um, uh, this is a little picture I found online, but basically, you know, it can be used for prostate cancer where we put seeds into the prostate. It can be used for GYN cancers where we apply an applicator in close to the tumor of the cervix and then the radiation source is delivered, you know, right to that area. It can be used in breast as well, brain cancer, skin cancer actually, and just different, we use different applicators depending on what you're doing. Um, even some people use it for lung cancers. And a really interesting one that we do here as well is um, for uh, melanomas of the eye, um, you can uh, use a plaque that basically is inserted into the eye, delivers the radiation just to that uh, tumor, and then it's removed. So it's kind of crazy. It may look and sound a little barbaric, um, but if, you're, if you like procedures, which I do, um, you know, it's kind of a cool part of, uh, of the radiation field. Um, this is just a picture, historic picture of radium capsules. So radium used to be used for brachytherapy and they would actually like put it into these capsules and then insert that into the patient depending like where in the body it was. Um, so things have come a long way, you know, from that time. Um, so I think in prostate cancer, often 
people might ask, well, why would you even use brachytherapy? Because we have so many other modalities like the CyberKnife, protons, VMAT, you know, what's the point? Basically in prostate cancer, we know that higher doses of radiation is, um, are more lethal to the prostate cancer cells. But like we were talking about the bladder and rectum being right next to the prostate, um, we can't give the same amount of radiation to the bladder and rectum as we want to give to the prostate cancer because the bladder and rectum, you know, would, would, they wouldn't tolerate it. It's too toxic. So brachytherapy actually allows us to um, minimize the dose to the bladder and rectum. So you can see in these pictures, unlike the earlier ones, you don't have that kind of low dose bath of radiation coming in, you know, from outside hitting the femurs, hitting the rectum. You still do get some radiation to the bladder and rectum, um, but it is much more conformal, which is the word we use a lot, just kind of tighter. And you can see with a permanent seed implant and a temporary implant, uh, you know, the dose distribution is pretty similar. Um, thank you, Binkley. Yes, yeah, so at Stanford, we do um, high dose rate. So um, I'm gonna, this part, I'm gonna just focus on brachytherapy for prostate cancer, but if you guys have questions about brachytherapy for other cancers, feel free to ask and um, we'll do our best to answer. Um, so we do only high dose rate. Typically, um, typically one institution will just do one type of brachytherapy, either high dose rate or low dose rate, just because the kind of safety around it and the QA and stuff, it's easier to just like have one type of brachytherapy that you do. They're both equally effective for treating prostate cancer um, and it's just slightly different. So for high dose rate, um, it's about a two to three hour procedure under general anesthesia. The patient is, you know, in the dorsal lithotomy position, as you can see here. Um, what we do is place temporary needles. This is like a little pictograph of these temporary needles going into the prostate through the perineum. Um, and we're avoiding the bladder, avoiding the rectum. And we do this under ultrasound guidance. So this is a transrectal ultrasound of the prostate in the sagittal view, so from the side. And here's a needle going in. The rectum is back here and the bladder is kind of up here. So we can see as we're putting these needles in exactly where they're going in real time. We plan the radiation based on the ultrasound and the um, location of the needles. Here's kind of a little pictograph to show that. Um, that here's an ultrasound, um, here's a bunch of needles, or maybe these are seeds, I'm not sure. Um, and then we plan out the radiation dose lines. Um, and then basically the radiation source, um, we use iridium-192 for the high dose rate procedures. And um, it's, uh, uh, it's housed in this little unit that looks like a little robot called um, an afterloader. And it sits in there most of the time, it's shielded and everything. We hook up, once we have all the needles in place, and I, let's see, do I have a picture? Well, I don't have a picture of the needles, but essentially uh, the needles are coming, you know, are, are in the perineum, um, in the prostate, they're kind of fixed on a little template so they can't move around and the patient's under anesthesia so the patient's not moving. And then we hook these catheters up from the afterloader, um, this here, to the um, patient here. So this is the template that we use. Here are all the needles going in. Here they're hooked up to the catheter and essentially the source goes from the afterloader through these catheters into the needle, into the patient. It sits in the patient in each needle for a number of seconds, just depending on the plan that we've created. Um, and then it goes back into the afterloader and then it goes into the second needle. So you can see that they're labeled here and they're labeled here. So then it would go into the second needle and sit in that needle for a certain period of time and then go back out. So um, that's what's called a temporary implant because <clears throat> the radiation source is only temporarily sitting in the prostate in those needles. So there's, um, so then once the procedure is finished, everything is taken out of the patient 
and there's no radiation inside the patient when they're finished with that two to three hour procedure. The other type of brachytherapy commonly used is this permanent seed implant or low dose rate brachytherapy. And like we said, um, you know, you kind of would do one or the other. Um, they're equally effective, but in it, the kind of setup is the same. It's a two to three hour procedure under general. Um, but instead of kind of planning the radiation once you have all your needles in place during that two to three hours, for the seed implant, you have to plan ahead of time. So you do some things to get that in place. You order these permanent seeds, which I have some pictures of here. There's different source strengths. Palladium and iodine are commonly used. This is a picture of cesium seeds, and you can see just how small they are. Um, and they're usually in some kind of capsule that um, makes them, for lack of a better term, kind of like sticky so that they um, sit in the prostate and hopefully don't move around. Um, and so you, you will basically do the same thing as far as like placing these seeds. This is a fluoro image of a patient who had a seed implant. And you can see, you know, there's a lot of seeds. So depending on which source strength you use, you can implant up to like 100, 150 seeds. And instead of just having one source go into one needle and kind of sit at different locations, which is what we do for the temporary implant, you literally drop seeds into the prostate along kind of a line, kind of as you can see here, to create that dose distribution um, to treat the whole prostate. The difference with the low dose rate is that there are some restrictions to the patient because they leave the procedure and they do have radioactive material in their prostate. Um, and so they, you know, things like they can't be around little kids, they can't be around pregnant women, they can't, you know, um, you know, they shouldn't be in rooms really, really close to other people for, you know, X number of days, depending on the source of radiation that's used. And um, we work very closely with our physicists. Um, in everything, but especially in brachytherapy and, and with giving patients, um, you know, these kind of um, recommendations. Um, I see this question, can they have an MRA? Yes, um, seeds are compatible with MR, um, so they can have an MRI. Okay, next question is, Patients treated with high dose rate brachytherapy are given certain restrictions after their discharge, true or false? Good, so actually, um, they are not. And I mean specifically, I didn't really say that. I mean specifically um, like exposure restrictions because um, after high dose rate, um, there's no radiation in the patient. And so they don't, um, they don't need any restrictions as far as who they're around or what they do. They can basically not tell anybody that they've had it. If you've had low dose rate brachytherapy or you have the permanent seeds in your body, same thing, um, you do have restrictions, some things about who you're around. You also do get like a little card um, in case you go to an airport or through a metal detector. Occasionally, you know, that might set it off or something like that. Um, okay, any questions about brachytherapy you guys are using about before I go into kind of the I was just gonna go through kind of how we decide which modality to give patients, but I'd be happy to talk more about brachytherapy if you guys have questions. No, okay. All right, so um, the next thing I just wanted to go through is kind of, like we talked about in the beginning, some of these patients can have, you know, five or six options as far as what they're gonna do. Um, this is a little schema I took from one of my partners. Um, and basically you can see here, you know, the risk groupings like we talked about, NCCN, low risk, 
intermediate risk, high risk. And then these are kind of some of the treatment options. Um, he has up here five-year PSA recurrence risks, and this is even with treatment. So um, this is kind of oldish numbers, but even patients with high-risk disease who get treated, the old data says, you know, they could have recurrence of risk up to 50%. I would argue with newer data that, um, you know, maybe it's less than that. It's more like 20% now, and this is lower, more like 10%. But um, I guess the point is prostate cancer can still come back no matter the grade, no matter the treatment you get. Um, so these patients do need to be followed basically for their lives um, with PSA tests. Um, so you can see that really you could do brachytherapy for anyone. Um, SBRT or Sarbanerf is really used for low risk or intermediate risk patients. Um, combination therapy is used for more higher grade intermediate risk or high risk patients. And if you just wanted to get regular old external beam or protons, you can do that kind of for any, any uh, risk grouping. But patients, you know, are often like super confused and they don't really know, you know, what they want to do. Um, and it's pretty confusing. So some factors, you know, we can use to help them in making this decision is, you know, what's their life expectancy? If their life expectancy is less than 10 years, we may think differently about them if, unless, or if they, if their life expect, if they're 50 and they get prostate cancer, you know, you're going to think about that patient differently. What other comorbidities do they have? Obviously their risk grouping, like we talked about. And then kind of their initial function, which we think about things like their urinary function, do they have lower urinary tract symptoms, their erectile function, rectal function, size of their prostate, and how big their tumor is. And there are some contraindications to radiation for prostate cancer. So we want to, you know, as a resident, you also learn like when should you not give radiation? When is it unsafe? Um, and who should avoid radiation. And um, in prostate cancer, usually I recommend surgery for patients who are younger and have severe lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs. Um, an AUA score is a score, an American Urologic Association kind of symptom score that it's a little questionnaire. Urology and radiation oncology often have patients fill out about things like frequency to pee, getting up at night, do they empty completely, those kind of things. Um, and so if a patient comes in and they've had really bad LUTs for a long time um, and they're younger, usually I push them to surgery because radiation you know, causes some urinary um, side effects. And so I don't want their urinary quality of life to be worse after their treatment. And like we said in the beginning, they have the option of surgery. It's not like it's a worse treatment. So you kind of want to find that balance for people. Um, if they have huge prostate glands, um, you know, there's that there's they're usually not a great radiation candidate. Um, and also it makes them not a good candidate for some of the brachytherapy procedures so that you may want to avoid radiation in those patients. If they've had prior radiation, we do not want to radiate them again. And basically that's because they've kind of burned, if they've had prior radiation in that area, because that means they've kind of like burned a bridge for lack of a better term, as far as uh, the, um, the tolerance of the other organs, like the bladder and rectum in that area. And so, you know, we'd really try to avoid re-irradiating the same area um, a second time. If they have inflammatory bowel disease or active autoimmune disease, you want to avoid radiation in general but um, IBD patients, um, we tend to avoid radiating. Now, we do sometimes, you know, for Crohn's um, or um, UC patients, we will radiate them. But if they have a surgical option, that may be a better option for them, depending on how many other surgeries they've had. Okay, so again, back to kind of how we're going to choose options for these patients. Um, Dr. Boynowski is one of like my senior mentors here. He's also works in GU. And basically for prostate cancer, we know, as we said kind of before, higher radiation is better. 
Um, there's data that brachytherapy reduces recurrences. So sometimes we'll give external radiation and then boost the prostate with the brachytherapy, depending on the stage of the patient. And we can use hormone therapy, um, which has been shown to improve survival in some risk groups. I'm not going to go into this today because it's a whole other topic. Um, but I just wanted to kind of review the options by stage with you guys so you kind of understand um, uh, you know, when we would use radiation in what situation. So low risk patients are those patients who have like Gleason 6 cancers and low PSAs. So they can basically do surveillance, like we said, or treatment, and they could do surgery or radiation. And often we offer them external radiation or brachytherapy. So they have kind of both of those options. Um, intermediate risk patients who are the ones who have, you know, Gleason 7 disease, maybe a higher PSA, um, they can, again, do external radiation, brachytherapy, or the combination where we give some externally and some internally with brachytherapy. Um, these are a little more nuanced things, but, you know, um, why would, so sometimes someone might ask, well, if an intermediate breast patient has all these options, like how do you choose? So for external beam, you might preferentially give that to patients who are older and they want to avoid general anesthesia. Um, or, you know, if they can't get brachytherapy because of their size of their gland. Um, you might preferentially give brachytherapy for someone who has really good urinary function and a small gland size. And then you might do combination for someone who has like a high volume cancer or high grade disease, four plus three cancer, and you want to be really aggressive. Um, and then high risk patients, they again have the surgical option. And for radiation, we really push combination external beam, part of it given with that VMAT approach, and then part of it given internally with brachytherapy. Um, so that's kind of what we recommend for high-risk patients. Um, you know, it's very confusing. I think if you went to a lot of different places, people would kind of have their go-to recommendation for a low-risk patient, an intermediate, or a high-risk patient. And um, it is definitely institution dependent and kind of biased. There's a lot of data out there about prostate cancer. Um, and uh, if you go into radiation oncology, you would obviously learn a lot more about this. Um, logistics of treatment, just to give you a sense of kind of the length of these treatments and what we're talking about. Um, if patients get external beam, which is that VMAT approach, you know, you're looking at potentially 26 treatments. This is kind of the standard that we do here, but in the community and maybe kind of more old school doctors, they'll actually give them 40 fractions, um, which is eight weeks of radiation. So it's once a day, Monday through Friday for eight weeks. So you can imagine patients, you know, these schedules are kind of cumbersome for patients. The nice thing about brachytherapy or what we do HDR is it's only two fractions, one week apart. So a lot of patients, if they can get brachytherapy, they're pretty excited to do this because it's logistically you know, a lot easier on them than these kind of longer schedules. And then if you do combination, um, it's, you know, again, like six weeks or so, but um, those are really for the more high risk patients. And then hormone therapy we give typically starting before radiation and then during radiation and depending on your risk group um, for a while after. Um, and then I just wanted to give you guys a sense of some of the side effects that are likely after radiation treatments. Um, you've probably heard this before, but many um, with external beam, uh, many patients get tired. Uh, I usually tell patients they'll have urinary bother, so frequency and urgency kind of feelings. They may get um, diarrhea or a loose stool, and those are most of the ones from external beam radiation. And then it's very unlikely for them to get things like bleeding from the bladder or rectum. And then even more unlikely, you know, most, pa most patients ask us like, am I gonna be nauseated, vomiting? Am I gonna lose all my hair? No, you know, for these type of treatments, they really don't get those type of side effects just because it, it doesn't affect those organs. Um, and if we need to, you know, for if they've got urinary issues, we give them medicines like Flomax and Advil, 
if they get diarrhea, we give them Imodium, but we really don't prescribe a lot of medicines during radiation treatments for prostate cancer. Um, it's typically very well tolerated. Um, late side effects are side effects that could happen like years after radiation. So, on, you know, more commonly they report some kind of change in their urination. Less commonly, you know, they could have some bleeding from damage to the bladder or damage to the rectum called proctitis or cystitis. Um, those are pretty uncommon. They really don't get incontinence um, like they can get with surgery. And, um, but they do get erectile dysfunction. So obviously for men, this is a big thing to talk about. And a lot of men weigh kind of the risk of ED surgically, radiation kind of um, as a main side effect potential. And then anytime we give radiation, we counsel patients that they could develop a cancer induced from the radiation, which is usually 20 or 30 years later. later. And typically, if that happens, it's in the area that was radiated. So in the pelvis, we were about a bladder or rectal cancer induced by the radiation. This is very uncommon. Um, and we don't recommend different screening or anything like that. Brachytherapy has very similar side effects to what we just talked about, but less likely to have um, GI side effects just because the rectum doesn't get a lot of radiation. Um, and then late side effects, similar things like changes in urination, changes in erectile function, um, and then unlikely to develop incontinence and even less likely to get proctitis or cystitis um, compared to external radiation. And then, uh, this is not really good for you guys, that's a, that's a, I put maybe more data in here than I should have, but um, um, let's do the next poll question. So a patient with low risk prostate cancer, is this true or false? A patient with low risk prostate cancer could avoid treatment surgery radiation completely if they wanted to. Yeah, good. So they, um, they can, they can do active surveillance. Um, and so that's usually recommended for low risk patients. Um, and they can always choose to get, um, to get um, a treatment later if their cancer you know, becomes more aggressive, for example. Okay, and then we do use radiation after surgery sometimes for prostate cancer. Now, um, these are some nuances that you would learn you know, as a resident, but you may hear adjuvant radiation for prostate cancer or salvage radiation for prostate cancer. Basically, it's a nuanced definition depending when you give it. So adjuvant just means you get it right after. Salvage means you get it only if your PSA is going up after surgery. And there's some different definitions of a rising PSA after surgery, but in the interest of time, I'll not focus on those. So who gets adjuvant radiation? There is some data to suggest that um, patients that have high-risk features after their surgery should get radiation. Those high-risk features mean um, involvement of the, of the capsule or seminal vesicle involvement, um, a positive margin at the time of their surgery, um, or some soft criteria for high-grade cancers. Okay, and then salvage basically means they have a rising PSA after prostatectomy or a detectable PSA after prostatectomy, and those patients should get radiation. And what I'm just showing here is that here's a pre-salvage radiation PSA with this blue being the lowest, 0.01 to 0.2, and light blue being above two. And here's freedom from biochemical failure. So basically, this is showing that if you treat patients after surgery at a really low PSA, they do better, and you can actually you know, cure some of these patients. Um, if you treat at a higher PSA, you're less likely to kind of um, affect the, the trend of the PSA. So this is just to say, you know, we do give radiation after surgery relatively commonly. Um, and um, it's, you know, a similar course to the external beam treatments. We can't give internal treatments after surgery, um, but it is an option. So patients... Um, can get both modalities. We don't want to do that, but we can if we need to. 
I'm going to skip this thing about hormones because we really didn't go into it. Um, but here's an example, um, you know, of, uh, of an x-ray for the, um, the green is kind of the prostate bed contour. So it's kind of the space in between the bladder and the rectum where the prostate used to sit. And we radiate that area in the um, post-operative setting. And it's about seven weeks of treatment of that daily treatment. Um, and sometimes we radiate the lymph nodes just depending on their risk. Um, and the side effects are very similar, but they have less um, GU toxicity just because their prostate's gone. So they don't kind of really notice as much. Um, so that's kind of it. If you guys have questions or any interest in radiation in the future, let me know. I'd be happy to talk with you guys or meet with people. Um, and hopefully you got something out of our virtual clerkship. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, I'd be happy to go back to anything. Oh yeah, Binkley, if anyone wants to see HDR, we do have a lot of cases coming up. Um, so if anybody's interested, um, we could have you guys observe you know, in the future to kind of see what that's like. So just reach out to us. Okay, well, thanks everybody for your attention and hope you um, learn something and let us know um, if we can help you in any other way. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Nice.